It's been 25 years since we made Muppet Christmas Cow. That's a long time. It doesn't seem that long, but I'll tell you, this was your very first feature directing this job. This was. And you did an incredible job. I'm not you just did, saying that. No, like, you did a great job. I really did. It was okay. That, but it wasn't a big job like yours. Yeah. You had a big job. <laughs> we should watch it. All right, let's watch it and talk about it. So the opening shot of the film. We built this miniature version of London where I think the buildings were probably about this big. I mean, really small. And then the camera pushes in over the top. And in order to get the depth of field so that it doesn't feel like a miniature, you have to shoot with the camera rolling very, very slowly. In real life, the camera was barely moving. It, it then transitions from a model shot over into the set, going, yeah. coming down off of the roofs and, and going into the set. And I just love the idea of, of simply of a, of a shot that introduced the world and brought us straight to our narrator, to, yeah. to, yeah. to Gonzo. But my favorite thing about that shot that comes down over the top are the pigs in the foreground who... <laughs> I was one of those pigs. And I know. Dave was one of them. Dave says it's, my fa it's one of my favorite lines in the movie. Is, well, that was a fine meal. Yes, it was, wasn't it? Yes. Where should we do now? Let's have a lunch. Oh, good idea. <laughs> <laughs> and you just made it up. It was just improvised. Yeah, we did a lot of ad living yeah. of little things like that. A moment ago, we saw the pan that came down over the shop door, and yeah. the, there was a sort of a cornice above the door, and I was inside that thing, lying there, it was like a coffin, and when we got done shooting, you know, everybody just went to lunch, and I'm sitting in my coffin. Did and, we just leave you there? Yeah, I got left there for Nobody a while. Nobody told me. I had screamed a little bit. How long were you left? Uh, well, you know, I found this, this is something <laughs> I learned from horror movies, if you bang on the coffin, <laughs> somebody comes. Hello! Welcome to the Muppet Christmas Carol. I am here to tell the story. And I am here for the food. When was the first time that we well, this paired was, Rizzo and This Gonzo? was the first time they were really a comedy duo that appeared in something. We worked together for years, you know. Two characters were in lots and lots of scenes together, and we had good chemistry, we had a lot of fun. But I think when Jerry wrote this, I believe he told me that he, he loved the idea of Gonzo delivering that prose, which was yeah. an important element, and I think it really was a good decision. But then just to, to relieve it a little bit, the idea of a sidekick for Charles Dickens being a rat was just an absurd, muppety idea, and it, it, felt, it felt right. He was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, clutching, covetous old sinner. Bob Cratchit. Yes, Mr. Scrooge? Who is this? Michael, right from Mr. the beginning, Ramblin, said, I'm going to play the movie like I'm acting opposite the Royal Shakespeare Company. And, and it takes a really good comedian to understand that if they play a part really dramatically, the result is going to be funny because of the circumstance. So he knew that the more sincerely he played Scrooge, the funnier the dynamic would be between him and, and the other Muppet characters. Michael Caine was told that this was Brian's first film, and he said I, I was, he was shocked. He couldn't believe that it was Brian's first film because he was so good. Well, how about that? That's very sweet. If you please, Mr. Scrooge, it's gotten colder. Yeah. Any bookkeeping staff would like to have an extra shovel full of coal for the fire? We can't do the bookkeeping. Yeah, all of our pens have turned to inksicles. Yeah. Our assets are frozen. How would the bookkeepers like to be suddenly unemployed? Keep <laughs> This is my island in the sun. When the rats suddenly broke the reality of the film completely and are suddenly in in uh, hula skirts and stuff and, and saying it's a heat wave, that we debated that joke over and over. And we said, you know, this joke is probably going too far. It just isn't Dickens. It's just sort of goofy. And then it worked so well that when we went to do Muppet Treasure Island, we decided to let the rats just literally play their own storyline completely that had nothing to do with the movie that was contemporary even though the rest of the movie was period because we realized that really the audience was happy to accept the rats doing anything there's magic in the air 
summer this evening. Yeah, well, so, okay, so here's where Kermit b- b- blows the, the candle out. And everybody always talks about, how'd you get Kermit to blow out that candle? And yeah. honestly, I'm pretty sure we just had a tube on the other side of his head. Yeah, probably. <laughs> we just blew through the tube. It was actually very, very old school. I didn't realize it was going to be quite this scary, this doorknob. I mean, it's so, it's always really frightening in, in every version of the movie, but I thought I thought we had done it in a funny way Jacob. when it turns into Statler and says Scrooge, but I think the, the morphing bothered young kids. The young, young kids were still very scared by it. Whoa, that's scary stuff. Hey, should we be worried about the kids in the audience? No, it's all right. This is culture. Again, we knew it was potentially very scary, the ghost sequence, and we were trying to really lighten it by bringing Statler and Waldorf in. And we actually shot it in a, in a super old school way. We, we shot it in the oldest way that ghosts have been done, where we shot the characters on black and then went and shot the shots, same film, rewound the film, and then shot the film again on the sets to make, uh, to make the ghosts transparent. There's a great little scene when they go over the, here it is. So there's this scene where Gonzo has to get Rizzo over the fence. This is one of those that we just made up, because this has nothing to do with Dickens. We wrote it when we were storyboarding, because I needed a little scene to get him around back. And then we came up with this simple little joke that Rizzo's climbed all the way up the fence, and he's jumped down, he thinks he's gonna die. And then Rizzo just walks back through the bars, because he could have walked right through from the very beginning. I just, it's such a simple, silly little scene. What? You can fit through those bars? Yeah. You You are are such an idiot. idiot. (laughs) (laughs) I knew that I wanted the Ghost of Christmas Past to have her hair and her and her dress sort of flowing. I started looking into doing rods in fluid, but that's how we shot her. We shot her in a water tank. Every one of her shots are in a water tank, and she's worked with clear plastic rods. What are we doing? Nothing. What? I'll just hold on. What? Ah! Yeah, Michael was on wires, and he's holding nothing, because obviously the ghost of Christmas past was shot in a water tank. So Michael's holding on to nothing, and, and then we, we put the ghost. It was, you know, some fancy compositing for the time. <laughs> My mind is filled with the here and now, and the now is... Christmas! Oh. <laughs> I don't believe I've ever met anybody like you before, sir. Ghost of Christmas Present is, I think, really notable here because it was a fairly large costume. It was made to look larger in the beginning of this scene, and then he shrunk down to uh, the size that he actually is. But it was Don Austin inside a costume and Jerry Nelson doing the character, the voice, and the uh, radio control facial expressions. And the character is just so warm and so convincing. It was a real measure of the chemistry that Don and Jerry had and the genius of both of them and the way it was shot, too. The Ghost of Christmas Present is such a delightful personality that even Scrooge can't help but enjoy him a little bit. I also love when he shrinks in the Ghost of Christmas Present. These are all forced perspective shots. The mice were way up close to the camera, and the Ghost of Christmas Present was way back. And those two horses, I should comment. <laughs> Richard Hunt had died not too long before this movie. He was one of our main core puppeteers. I had to do these one of these horses, and I thought, well, let's put a let's put a tribute to Richard in, maybe. And then I named him Richmond, and and then I would send emails to Brian from Richmond, uh, asking for bigger parts for the horses. He says, Good. "Me and the other horse would like to have a." A little more screen time. Could you do a number for us? Oh, here it is. The, yeah, this is the hardest shot when, when Kermit comes dancing down the street with uh, Tiny Tim on his shoulders. We, we recreated the ground is actually a barrel. It's not actually flat. So the ground is a barrel with uh, snow and cobblestones. Snow and cobblestones glued to it. it and it's like turning, that. and then the puppeteers are dressed in blue. It's all composited onto a shot that's moving down the street. Doesn't sound that hard. Well, that's hard. <laughs> Not for me, I was in my dressing room. And now I leave you with the ghost of Christmas yet to come. 
close to Christmas yet to come coming was this wall of smoke and we could only do one take. So they built up all this smoke behind a big curtain and I had to yell to Michael to turn. He said, I, I said, I'm gonna yell turn when the smoke's coming up behind you. And I'm yelling, turn, 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 Michael, turn. He didn't hear me at first. And then luckily he turned right as it was coming. And this is a, this is a 60 foot wall of smoke that just came hurtling at him and it worked great. And that was a digital effect right there with the world swirling. And at the time we were like, this is amazing. It's a computer digital effect. <laughs> and of yeah. course now they do everything with computers. But at the time we were like, this is amazing. <laughs> Just as an insight, the way we do stuff like that is that we wear uh, raincoats, like slickers with uh, rain hats and hoods and anything to keep ourselves dry. And of course, we're working around monitors and electrical cables and water. And so you never know whether it's going to be your last take. <laughs> but um, it's, one of the, it's one more thing that people don't realize about what we do, that it's painful and uncomfortable. Scrooge is saved. What can happen now? Yeah. You there, boy. And if you notice, there's a little thing where Bean sees them run past, and that's like a little secret Easter egg. The idea being once Scrooge has redeemed himself, Gonzo and Rizzo are no longer invisible. And then they ran across the ground and they left footprints and Bean saw them. And the idea was basically now the story has caught up to real time and, and they're no longer invisible storytellers. I didn't, I didn't know that until just now. Yeah. The love we found the love we found. You know what I'm happiest about with this thing that we just did, that we're, where we're sitting here talking? <laughs> that I didn't just lose it. I managed to get through with just a little tear or two, and I thought I was going to make a fool of myself. I would like to see you I know. I mean, I, that's, <laughs> that's, why, that's why I did it. <laughs> Maybe it seems pretentious, but I think it's a perfect film. Well, that's very sweet, but the clouds are moving too much. Uh, <laughs> who cares? I'm, I'm crying. <laughs> I think the process of making something like this is part of our own little emotional journey. And to then realize that the audience loves it is really touching. <laughs> I'll get out of here. <laughs> Where's the door? <laughs>